Bernard Baruch was the strategist who effectively um, acted as the go-between, but he was a very, very powerful player between the group that met at Jekyll Island and, and effectively getting uh, Woodrow Wilson to sign the Federal Reserve Act into, into right. law. Bar Baruch was the guy who effectively created the strategy for bringing America into the First World War. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who effectively created the strategy for the 1929-1933 Crash. A bit like Kissinger, by the well, sound of it. Well, he was the pro he was the mentor of mm. both Kissinger and Brzezinski. The game plan, right from the outset, is to asset strip completely. Asset strip the the government, the um, the corporations, the businesses, and the individuals. So it's a, that's why I say it's a multi generational agenda. So the process of stripping starts on the basis that you put the money in which is then owed back to you, but it's owed back to you with interest. But the interest wasn't put in, so the interest has to come out of the accumulated wealth of the nation. So what happens is year on year, every year, uh, by, mi little by little, the nation's wealth is eroded until you get to the point of Iceland or Ireland where basically there is nothing left. Imagine that's you, okay? We're going to try and build an economy around this person. Well, everyone generally has some money. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him a bucket to keep his money in. Now, let's say this person works for this company. And the company's got a bucket with its money in. Let's put some money in it. So every week or every month, this company empties some money from its bucket into your bucket. So you get paid. So then what happens? Well, you probably spend some of that money on things that you need to live. So the money goes from your bucket back into industry's bucket, the private sector, retailers, people who make things. But of course, we've got governments, local authority and central government. And probably, I would estimate, around about half of everyone's money who pays taxes ends up back in the government's coffers. So there's the government's bucket. The money goes round to the government. And of course, companies have to pay taxes as well. So money goes out of the private sector's bucket in the government's bucket. What about people who work in the public sector? Well, they have money too. Hospitals, doctors, nurses, firemen, policemen, people who work in the public sector, they get paid by the government. But of course, they have to pay taxes as well. So the money goes round and round and round. Now, the system I've drawn there doesn't have a bank in it. What is a bank for? In my opinion, a bank because we've got money flowing around that system all the time. It goes into your bucket and into someone else's bucket. It's being transferred. It's like an engine with oil in it. That's what money is. Now a bank, in my opinion, should be, if there's a blockage, if there's some money, if money dries up in one part of that system, you would need to feed money in where there's a shortage. It's like a reservoir which is level changes. That's from, in my mind, that's what the function of a bank is. So money comes out of the bank and it goes into private industry and it goes into individuals who want to have loans to buy houses or to buy cars. But of course we know that eventually that money has to be paid back. Now, who's creating the wealth in this system? Is it the bank? It's not the bank. Is it the government? It's, not the, it's the people who do the work. People who work in the public and private sectors. Equally, equally as important. Now, so we've got this system where money's going round and round and round. Now, in that system, you'll notice one thing I haven't mentioned yet is interest. I'm not considering interest at this point. I'm saying that the bank is there to account for shortfalls in the flows when we get blockages, okay? Now, just consider for one moment. We've got that system. It's working nicely. Just consider interest. So the bank then starts charging interest. So every piece of money that flows out, it wants extra money back in addition to the amount that it loaned out. Now there's a word for this. It's called usury. And usury is actually illegal in some religions. In the Islamic religion, they, don't, they think that borrowing money for interest is fundamentally wrong and flawed. Now when we consider interest in our society, it is, it is accepted as necessary as breathing the air. And this is something we've got to get out of. Because in my opinion, it's the fractional reserve system and interest which creates the boom-bust economy. All right? So just think about that.
question no one ever questions interest on the BBC news, the fact that we could do away with it. And I'll explain how I think we could do away with it. The modern banking system creates money out of nothing. And the process is the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. And if you want to be slaves to the bankers and pay the costs of your own slavery, then let the banks create money. Now, who just said that? I didn't. That comes from a former director of the Bank of England. The famous artist uh, Francis Bacon once said, usury dulls and damps all industries, improvements and new inventions, wherein money would be stirring if it were not for this slug. And that's what interest is. It's a slug. It's a leech on society because it's not actually adding any wealth into the economy. Now, if the bank starts charging interest, so every piece of money which flows out flows back with extra money, is that sustainable? Because what's going to happen is eventually all of the money is going to end up in the bank. And there's going to be none in the economy. And this is why in our current economic system, money has to be continually added in. And as I said before, adding that money into the economy, what does it do? It devalues the very pound in your pocket. As soon as you add in one pound of money into an economy, it devalues the pound that you've got. This is why we have inflation. This is why in almost all economies we have inflation, because there's extra money being put in. Now, if the banks didn't charge interest, you could easily control inflation. So just hypothetically, we've done away with interest. A government can either add in or take money out of the economy quite easily. How it can add money, it can just print it and use that money to pay its public sector. It can take money out of the economy by taxing more. So the government can control how much money is in that economy. And by doing that, could control inflation easily, keep inflation at zero. And you wouldn't need to put your money in the bank because, you, you know, you wouldn't have... The reason why people put the money in the bank is because it gets devalued because of inflation and they need to earn interest. You wouldn't need to put your money in a bank. How can we have banks without interest? It's very simple. All you do is move the system of banking into the public sector because that's what banks are. They're providing a public service. So banks basically become nationalised. And I'm not talking about being a communist or even a socialist, because this is still a free market economy where the engine is the private sector creating wealth. You just get rid of all of these bankers who are incredibly rich, and you make the public sector basically uh, administer all loans. The electricity in a generator is similar to the money in a, in a monetary system. It goes round and round and round. It's a system. And the key thing, as you will know, having worked in the oil industry, is you, you must have control over these systems in order Absolutely. to manage them correctly. Now, a monetary system, for me, it must be controlled. And you think, well, what, what aspect of the monetary system needs to be controlled? I, I would suggest, if you think about what money is, all money is is a means of measuring the value of something. It's a measurement system. So for me, control means keeping that balance level. And how do you do that? Well, you must keep the amount of money in the economy equal to the amount of wealth in the economy. So if an economy grows by 2%, you add in 2% of money. If the economy shrinks by 2%, you take 2% out of money. And that way, you eliminate inflation. Okay. And how do you do that? Well, all you do is you give the government the power to create new money and through its tax and spend um, policies, um, control the amount of money in the economy. But it's not as simple as that, because where does new money come from? In the diagram I've drawn here, I've said that the government can just create it. Well, that's not quite true, and this is part of the problem. Let's ask the question, where does new money come from? Well, it comes from the central bank, as I explained earlier, which actually, well, there's argument over whether the government owns it. A lot of people think it's owned by private shareholders, but it's created under a royal charter, which means it doesn't have to declare its shareholders. Some people say it's owned by the Queen and the Rothschilds. Now, as I mentioned before, this um, fractional reserve system, the, the central bank, the Bank of England, deposits money in the banks, and they then multiply that money up and charge interest. The, the, the central bank can also add debt money into the economy by loaning it to the government through things called, for example, um, quantitative easing. About a year ago, I believe, 
the Bank of England bought bonds and other assets from the government at £200 billion. Pounds. That's money the government's got to pay back to the Bank of England. But the Bank of England just press a button on a computer and it just appears. Is that fair? And all this debt money that's added into the economy devalues the, the pound in your pocket. The green indicates money going round and round the system, which isn't debt money. Over time, 10, 20 years, m more and more of the economy's money is actually debt money. In other words, it doesn't belong to the people who hold those buckets. It belongs to the central bank or the banking system. And eventually, all the money in the economy turns red. It's debt money. The government's national debt currently is 1,000 billion pounds. Well, let's put that in perspective. That's 40,000 pounds for every single house. And where's the government getting that from? You. And the, the public are up in arms about what the bankers have done, but bankers to the British public means Barclays and Lloyds and, and all of these others, and that's mm -hmm. all it means. Not the central bank. Mm -hmm. The issue has been, once again, mm -hmm. deflected onto a few greedy bankers mm -hmm. who, yes, were way out of order, mm -hmm. but they're taking the flak. They're the ones who, well, literally are taking the flak for the collapse mm -hmm. of the economy. And it, it wasn't them, it lays beyond them. The interest rates is people making money out of money, yeah. which is essentially immoral because they've not created anything tangible or of worth. Because I'm still talking about a completely free market economy, so the people who get wealthy are the people who do the work. But Richard, you, you've hit the nail absolutely on the head. To get rid of interest, you've got to get rid of the, uh, the central banks. And that is absolutely critical to changing the existing paradigm. Those nations that are described as the axis of evil actually all have one thing in common. You know, this is Venezuela, Libya, Cuba, uh, Iran, formerly Iraq, Syria, North Korea, all of these nations are free of the clutches of the World Bank. They all have retained control of their own economy. And so why are they demonized? Because they're demonized because they're out of the clutches of the World Bank. He who borrows sells his freedom. Peter Sutherland, who is tagged the father of globalization, effectively sacrificed the Irish nation and the Irish people to his globalist masters in September of 2008 when he instructed Cowan and Lenihan to effectively under, to get the taxpayer to mm -hmm. underwrite all the debts of the Irish bank. Imagine there's a desert island and we all go there. We set up our little economy. We build a little money making press. Some people work in the builder houses. Some people doctors and nurses and we've got a bank. It's not charging interest. It's great. But one day, the guy who's operating the, printing, the money printing press, he says, oh, there's another island nearby, I'm going to go and live on that. Sure, no problem, print your money over there. Just send the money across to us on a boat every month. Then he says, oh, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to pay me my £15,000 a year salary. What I want you to do is, I want you to pay me 5% continually on every note that I send you. Mm, all right then. So he sends £100 and he gets £5 a year on that. And he sends another, and the economy grows and grows and grows. Eventually, this man owns more money than the entire island put together. He says, oh, will you come and build me a palace on my island? Can you, can you, I want a Ferrari, I want this. He's the richest man, and he does no work. That's our current system. Where we are heading is the banksters operating on behalf of that inner cabal that we talked about, those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of the planet. What we're talking about is literally being not too many years away from the banksters literally owning everything that's on the planet and everyone on it. If they're going to control the world and bring about a new world order, what are they isn't China going to prevent that? Where does China fit into the, to the ultimate new world order that they want to create? Well, right? China is the richest country in the world in terms of fiat currency, because in terms of its debt, uh, or sorry, not its debt, mm. but it, what it is owed by, is, uh, by ostensibly the US and, mm -hmm. uh, and other Western governments around the world. But I mean, just the US debt to China is in the region of, uh, at a conservative estimate, $8 trillion. I mean, it's one of the reasons why you know, the, the, the US, or certainly the Federal Reserve, uh, has as part of its uh, game plan ultimately to literally destroy the US dollar. Because eight trillion times nothing is 
not a big yeah. number. And, and by the way, I mean, another key element of what's occurring right now is that the 100-year agreement between the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve, which was signed on December 22, 1913 by uh, Woodrow Wilson, this 100-year agreement actually expires at midnight on December the 21st, 2012. Okay. Now, let's go down that line then. Coincidentally. Uh, Okay, they, they, let's assume they're going to um, basically pull the rug on, on the dollar. So, so at some point, we don't have a dollar, and they're going to replace it with some other currency. So, so they, they then say, well, hey, China, you're not going to get all of these trillions that we owe you. And you think, you think that could happen? Oh, well, absolutely. China knows this. I mean, right now, if you're so, a gambler, you can buy US debt from China at about 10 cents on the dollar. I mean, if you give them gold, you know, they'll take your gold at 10 cents on the dollar because they'd rather have the hard than the fiat. So what's going to happen? Well, potentially, China just decides that it's going to um, recoup its uh, losses militarily. So you was, we were talking earlier, you think that could trigger World War III, uh, uh, Neil, Possibly. you I mentioned mean, That's it. one of the things about Libya as well, is, is, is interrupting uh, China's supply of oil, China's supply of gas, and says food. like that, food as well. The, if you look at um, what, what China's actually doing uh, in, in Africa is it's looking for mineral resources. A lot of it's actually connected with mobile phones and such like mm -hmm. that, strangely. But Rare earth. Yeah, exactly. And this is what they're doing. They're, they're in all these places. And what we're doing is we're stepping on their toes. We, but is this, is this the Western global elite um, going to war with a, an, an Eastern global elite? No, no, there elite? is no Western global elite. So you think elite. these corporatists... There is a global elite. Right. Th these corporatists have influence in China as well. Yeah, oh, yes. yeah, definitely. If you look at the secret societies like the, the um, started by people like the Lee family, I mean, this is yeah. sort of Fritz Springmeier's work and stuff like that. But if you, if you look, it doesn't even have to be China. The Thuggy in India, the Triads in Japan, the Tong, all these secret societies, the Mafia, all these influential crime syndicates, they're not. They're organised by the elites. I mean, just think about it. It's a game, I don't know if it's still available, but... Twenty odd years ago, there, there was a game called Risk, where, where basically you, you took on the role of a member of the global elite, and the and the purpose of the game was to dominate the world. Mm -hmm. Well, what these guys are doing is playing Risk for real. One of the challenges for Western governments will be to keep their people locked into consumerism, preventing them from realizing who they truly are. That this is the, what, if you like, uh, differentiates them from us apart from the fact that they have no love, no compassion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, they believe that this is a human weakness. Mm -hmm. And they believe that they can do what they do because we can't relate to their way of thinking because we're, we are constrained by love, inherent love and compassion for our fellow man, whereas these guys can cast that aside. This is where the cremation of care ceremony mm -hmm. at Bohemian Grove kicks in. But what they're, what they're looking to do over their multi-generational agenda is literally to establish total control of their global corporation, their global fiefdom with something in the region of 500 million employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, we are participating in the, uh, the reduction. How are we participating in that reduction in the population? By buying into their vaccine programs, by, by accepting fluoride in the water. Fluoride is well known uh, to be the most effective way of shutting down the natural release of uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, from the pineal gland, thereby preventing us from realizing who we truly are. The guys who are perpetrating this agenda are very, very, very good at what they do. We should never, ever underestimate their creativity and their ability to pull this off.